So it's, uh, we are very happy to have Professor Zohar Kumar Gotsky from Simon Center for Geometry and Physics, Stony Brook University, New York. And he's going to talk about the high temperature limit of QFT. I'm not giving a long introduction of Zohar, but yeah, um, he, he's going to talk about this, his recent work. So jo Zohar, please start from your side. Thank you so much. It's very nice to see all of you. So um, this is a talk about uh, some uh, uh, questions about the uh, quantum field theory at high temperature. Uh, also, uh, anybody please uh, interrupt me at any moment with whatever question you want to ask. Otherwise, I would end up talking to myself for an hour or even more, which would not be fun. So just interrupt whenever you want. Well, actually, this one slide, I forgot to update it. Uh, the paper just came out uh, some days ago with this safe uh, authors. Uh, so Chang Ha Choi is a student at Stony Brook University. And uh, these folks, Noam Chai, Saumi Dup Chaudhur, Elias Rabinovich, and Misha Smolkin are uh, from the Hebrew University in Israel. And as I said, I forgot to add the archive number. And the paper just came out. So let me just uh, gear up towards uh, defining what the question is. So many, uh, many of many quantum systems, of course, famously exhibit symmetry breaking. So magnets are probably the most uh, famous example that uh, magnets are in a symmetry broken phase where all the spins are aligned at low temperatures. Uh, other more complicated examples are, for instance, uh, massless QCD. Massless QCD is an example where there is a, a at zero temperature symmetry breaking. So there is some order. In condensed matter, there are a little bit more recent examples like the nail phase and the nail VBS transition. And usually the intuition uh, that we learn in school is that if you hit the systems up, namely you raise the temperature, then all these symmetries are restored at high temperatures. And of course, we know that this is true for magnets. Everybody knows that if you hit the magnet sufficiently, it will fall off from the fridge. So it loses its magnetic properties. So, and, so uh, Dohar, could you please talk about this uh, condensed matter phase a little bit more? Which one? This Neil phase. Uh, I wasn't intending to talk about it. It's just oh, a okay. famous example. Okay. In condensed matter physics where you start, in, so ferromagnets, are systems where the spins are tr where the spins like to be aligned okay okay now uh, at low temperatures this sometimes leads to phases with symmetry breaking these are the most famous magnets including those that are hanging on your fridge okay the nail phase is a little bit more interesting and it's uh, more re recent because it's a anti ferromagnet and the nail phase is an ordered phase in an anti ferromagnet but uh, conceptually it looks very much like a ferromagnet it's just like a symmetry breaking of the sort, uh, like SO3 broken to SO2. It's a pretty standard symmetry breaking phase, but it happens in a quantum anti-ferromagnet. Uh, in any case, in all of those examples, of course, we know experimentally as well as uh, just based on theoretical reasoning that we expect at sufficiently high temperatures or equivalently at sufficiently small beta, we expect that the symmetries would be restored. I want to emphasize here, I see that there are in the audience many experts on gauge theories. I'm not going to talk about confinement, deconfinement. I'm only talking about ordinary symmetries, ordinary symmetries which have a local order parameter like in the Landau paradigm. Uh, it's famously true that the confinement behaves in the opposite fashion, but I'm not gonna talk about non-local order here. I'm only asking questions about standard order and if I have time at the end, I'll actually try to, I can make a link between these two questions, but I'm not going to emphasize it now. So this is an example of an actual experiment. I stole this slide from some uh, paper by Bitcoin friends. And what do you see here? So the Y equals zero uh, axis, namely the X axis, is a zero temperature 
parameter. So you have zero temperature, you tune some transverse magnetic field. And at some point, there is a second order phase transition here. And if you have a lower transverse magnetic field, you're in a broken phase, and otherwise you're in a completely trivial phase. And then you heat it up. And an interesting thing is that this black line goes to the left rather than to the right. And this is very important. If the black line went to the right, that would mean that at high temperatures, you have a ferromagnetic phase dominating. So in this kind of phase diagrams, it's typical that the phase transition line goes towards the broken phase rather than the unbroken phase. And it seems pretty random, but the direction in which this line goes is, of course, the most important thing about these phase diagrams. That guarantees that at high temperatures, all the symmetries are restored. OK, so why does this happen? So there are two reasons that I am aware of. One reason is what you learn in school, in undergraduate, or maybe even before. You learn that at finite temperature, you do not need to minimize the energy. Rather, you need to minimize the free energy which is related to the energy in this fashion. And if you heat a system to large enough temperature, the second term dominates, and therefore you're trying to maximize the entropy. And then you, you allude to the intuition that maximal entropy states are disordered, because you have this intuition that the maximal entropy state cannot have any order. That, that, that doesn't make sense. So. So that's one reason that we believe that at high temperatures, symmetries are always restored. And then there is a much more sophisticated reason, which is mo more recent, and it's not that elementary. And it has to do with the ADS-CFT correspondence. In the ADS-CFT correspondence, there is a no hair theorem that uh, was proven by the condensed matter uh, ADS community. So the ADS condensed matter theory community. And what does the no goal theorem say? say? It says that there is a no hair. Uh, well, I didn't say it very clearly, but let me rephrase what I said. The statement that at high temperatures, the symmetries are restored is dual to the no hair theorem. Okay? And the no hair theorem was proven by gravity people, essentially, in the ADS-CMT community. So originally, I uh, got interested in this question because I wanted to prove the no hair theorem. And proving the no hair theorem is the same as proving that unitary quantum filters at high temperatures always restore the symmetries. So that's my original motivation of proving the no hair theorem. Uh, sorry, Johar. Um, yeah. But in asymptotically, the S spaces, there's no, no hair theorem, right? Well, let me just make it a little bit more, since there are many experts in the audience. I'm talking about systems which are heated up, no chemical potentials. Notice that, okay? I'm, I'm not talking about systems which have chemical potential. I'm talking about straight out, straight temperature. And this is dual to a black brain in ADS. And for a black brain in ADS, there is a no hair theorem. Nobody has ever found, not in the published literature, a hair for a black brain in ADS. But ADS is a special case of a CFT. What about QFTs? Okay, so you will soon see. I'll make an argument for why the question we can, instead of discussing this question in QFT, I'll actually discuss this question only in CFTs. And that's enough because at very high temperatures, by Wilsonian reasoning, we expect that the dynamics of very high temperature quantum filtering is dominated by the ultraviolet CFT that governs that quantum filter. So the question can be reduced to a question about the high temperature phase of conformal filter. Okay. And for black brains, there is actually a no go theorem. Let me just say that the, let me just say one little thing, just to be completely, uh, uh, just to be sort of give you a comprehensive answer. Up until two days ago, there was a no hair theorem. After we published the paper, we got a draft yesterday with somebody who claims that they constructed hair for a black brain. But uh, there is no, not, none of that in the published literature at this point, okay? Is that acceptable as an answer? Yes, for the moment, although I'll make some comment probably at the end. Okay, very good. You can. Okay, so I wanted to prove the no hair theorem, so I got interested in that. Let me just now mention uh, what would happen if this theorem was not true. 
what what would happen if there were conformal filters that broke a symmetry at the non-zero temperature? First, let me make a general remark. We will consider CFTs in d plus one space time dimensions. So d is my number of space dimensions. I want to make one clear one point very clear, which is that the physics is independent of t as long as t is non-zero. Since conformal filters have no scale, uh, any temperature is as good as any other temperature as long as it's non-zero. So if you come up with a conformal filter that breaks a symmetry at some temperature t, it will be true for any temperature t. There is no other scale in the problem. And that's, of course, very familiar if you do ideal CFT, because, um, I mean, n equals 4 super young Niels at, five, at temperature t is the same as 2t or 3t. It's all the same. So if there were counterexamples to this statement, that symmetries are always uh, un broken at finite temperature, then the black line would bend the other way, which would be pretty weird. I don't think that there are such phase diagrams in the literature. But the question is whether it's really always true. Okay, let me just one, make one comment. There is something uh, which one should know, which is that there is a different question about intermediate symmetry breaking that uh, Weinberg wrote a very famous paper about already 40, uh, 40, 46 years ago. And that is um, not about the asymptotic high temperature behavior of quantum filter. That's about intermediate temperatures. So it could be that in quantum filters that have several scales, there could be some intermediate scale where there is symmetry breaking. But it's not about the high temperature limit. In fact, in condensed matter, this is a very familiar phenomenon. There are materials like this, which you can buy on Amazon. And they have a slightly weird uh, crystal behavior. Their crystal symmetry between minus 18 Celsius and 24 Celsius is actually more ordered than at the low temperature crystal phase. So there are some funny crystals that have an intermediate phase, which is even more ordered than the true low temperature phase. But of course, if you heat them up sufficiently, they become, you know, quark gluon plasma or whatever. And uh, there is no... Uh, there is no order at high temperatures, but there are intermediate uh, temperature ranges where there could be something interesting. But I'm not interested in this question for now. The focus of this talk is about the, you know. Yes? Presumably, I mean, the, the quark gluon plasma was a joke, right? Presumably, even in the domain of condensed matter uh, physics at high enough temperatures, they will become. Uh, they'll melt or, or decay. Yeah, of course, a uh, silly joke. Of course, that even in condensed matter, they would become a liquid much before they become a quark gluon plasma. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was uh, maybe a silly joke. Um, so I'm not interested in this. And to avoid this discussion, we're not going to discuss general quantum filters. I'm going to discuss conformal filters, which is an idealized, uh, idealized setup. So here is the question that I want to pose. Are there unitary local conformal filters? They could be gauge theories or you know, any other conformal filter that you know, which break a global symmetry at finite temperature. So I'm not specifying which finite temperature because it doesn't matter. All finite temperatures are equally good. They're all the same. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer to this question. Uh, but we've uh, surprisingly found ex Wilson Fisher fixed points, which uh, show that this is possible. We found Wilson Fisher fixed points, which uh, upon heating them up, they break a symmetry spontaneously. This is very surprising. I didn't believe that such examples exist. But let me just tell you why this is not the final word on the subject. This is not the final word on the subject because Wilson Fisher fixed points live in fractional dimensions. And um, so they're not genuine, you know, complete quantum systems. In fact, they're techni technically speaking, they're not fully unitary because they live in fractional dimensions. So uh, this is not the final word on the problem. And in addition, the examples that we've constructed are vector models. They're Wilson Fisher type fixed points. They're not gauge theories. So that doesn't shed much light on the no hair theorem. But the, we've constructed some very non-trivial counterexamples, which have many interesting properties. And that's what I wanted to tell you about, because these counterexamples have uh, very interesting properties per se. 
And of course, now we're working on trying to extend it all the way down to integer dimensions. So is the question, is, are there any comments or concerns about the question? So that's the main question that we would like to ask. Um, excuse me? Yes? Um, so may I ask about the dimensions? So, um, so is it only for the four dimensions special? So, or can you consider about uh, interesting thing in one plus one D or some other dimensions? Yeah, so the examples I'm going to present today are in four minus epsilon. They're not in four, they're like in 3.9, okay? But I'll make some comments in the next slide or the one after about one plus one, two plus one, okay? I'll make some comments. If you have okay. still some questions, let me know. Okay. Okay, this is just, so it's gonna be probably in the next slide, yeah. So this slide, I'm just saying that, the, you know, if you wanna study this question, there are, first you could look at experiments. Uh, you could look at many weakly coupled constructions, gauge theories, uh, bank sachs like fixed points, supersymmetric constructions. You could do some work in gravity, which is the, uh, I mean, the, the, the no-go -go theorems are as good as their loopholes, and I'm sure that the no-hair theorem has many loopholes. And actually, we'll see also some general theorems. We'll be able to prove a little bit of some general theorems about the subject. Oh, and uh, Sainatan asked at the beginning about nail VBS. So it's one of those deconfined quantum critical points, and you see the black lines go again towards the ordered phases, which are called VBS and nail. And if you go straight up from the second order phase transition, then you're in a disordered phase. And what this uh, DQCP is, the point? Deconfined quantum critical point. Oh, okay, okay. okay. It's some uh, condensed matter terminology, which means just conformal filter. Okay. In our language, it's just some conformal filter, and that's it. Okay. Um, so now I wanted to make the comments that somebody asked about. Uh, you could ask it in which dimensions is this problem interesting? So actually, in one plus one dimensions, this can never happen. Namely, no symmetry breaking can take place at finite temperature. Why? Because finite temperature in one plus one dimensions is uh, the same as quantum mechanics because finite temperature is the same as a circle. And when you reduce one plus one dimensional uh, uh, conformal filters on a circle, you get a quantum mechanical model. And in quantum mechanics, no symmetries can break. You can also prove the same very easily from modular invariance using Cardi-like uh, tricks. So in one plus one dimensions, there is no such phenomenon. It's impossible that at finite temperature, there would be symmetry breaking. In two plus one uh, dimensions, so are you excluding large n? Because at large n, things may be different, right? Right, right. So in the paper, we even wrote a footnote that large n could be different. I agree. Okay. Large n could be different. I'm not talking about large n. I'm, so actually, if you, I was pedantic enough to put this uh, parenthesis here. You see? Okay. Yeah, la large n is a separate uh, issue. Actually, I'll talk a lot about large n in what comes. Now, in two plus one dimensions, for, because of Coleman's theorem, at finite temperature, you cannot break continuous symmetries, okay? So these are like little theorems you can immediately observe. So if you're interested in this phenomenon in two plus one dimensions, it has to be connected with discrete symmetries. And in three plus one, it may be both continuous and discrete. In four minus epsilon, it can be both continuous and discrete, as, soon as, as long as epsilon is not one. As long as epsilon is in this range, it can be both continuous and discrete. And that's the main reason for why what I'm telling you today is limited to uh, fractional dimensions, because epsilon equals one will correspond to two plus one dimensions, and the symmetry breaking that I'll tell you about today is continuous. And so it cannot occur, strictly speaking, in two plus one. But it would lead to some interesting consequence nonetheless. We'll get to it. Okay. If there are no questions about this, I'll now introduce, I want to introduce some very basic ideas in thermal field theory. Um, you might know that there are some infrared issues in thermal field theory. So I wanted to explain what are these infrared issues, how we deal with them, and what's the way to think about it. This will be important for what I'm going to say later. So let me just uh, go through that quickly. So to review this issue, let's consider the phi to the four model in three plus one dimensions. And this theory is of course very weakly coupled at long distances at zero temperature. 
So it's just free filtering. It flows to an infrared free filtering. So even though the zero temperature limit is very easy, uh, it's an infrared free filtering, at non-zero temperature, you might run into trouble. So what do we do at non-zero temperature? We compactify the theory on a circle of this radius. And then we Fourier expand all the mo And so you get something like this. You get this kind of Lagrangian. So what, what's the main thing? In the, what's, what, what are the important pieces? So we have a zero mode on the circle. Phi naught is a zero mode on the circle. And it has quartic self-interactions. The zero, the zero mode has quartic self-interactions. And so now you've got to be scared because uh, unlike three plus one dimensions, quartic interactions in two plus one dimensions are strongly coupled. So there is a strong coupling scale now, which is given by lambda times the beta minus one. So this is now a strong coupling scale, a genuine strong coupling scale. Uh, and then there are some interactions between the zero mode and higher Matsubara modes. So phi ends are some higher Matsubara modes. Okay, so now you have to be really nervous because even though the original model is solvable, in at finite temperature, you might run into strong coupling. And that's why there is an infrared issue in thermal filtering, that you have to be very careful about this non-perturbative regime. And sometimes you cannot avoid it. But luckily in this example, you can avoid it. Why? In this example, you can avoid the strong coupling scale, lambda to the times beta minus one, which is this prefactor, because there are these diagrams, which are called cacti diagrams in the literature. And these diagrams represent the interactions between the zero mode and higher Matsubara modes. And if you sum up all these contributions, you get an infinite sum, okay? Because there are infinitely many Matsubara modes. And uh, amusingly, you get the same infinite sum as in string theory, or like in the Casimir energy in any two-dimensional problem. And you find this answer for the mass squared of the zero mode. So the zero mode is actually not massless. It's not a zero mode. It has a non-zero mass due to these radiative corrections. And amazingly, it's positive, okay? So this sign is uh, very important. That it's positive is very important because if it were negative, you would get symmetry breaking at finite temperature. That the fact that the mass squared is positive is why there is uh, no symmetry breaking at finite temperature. But you have to be careful whether you've avoided the strong coupling scale. And this is a little bit uh, funny because the, squared, the mass squared is given by this scale and the strong coupling scale is given by that. So if you compare them correctly, because this has dimensions, the mass squared has dimensions of mass squared, and this has dimensions of mass. So if you take that to the second power and you compare it to that, you win. And you win just by square root of lambda factor. So basically you've been lucky and you've avoided a strong coupling scale by a mere square root of lambda. So as long as lambda is very small, you win. Uh, namely, you can compute the mass reliably and it comes out to be positive. And you find that at finite temperature, uh, the vacuum of the theory corresponds to an unbroken phase. And that's of course the standard uh, ferromagnet story, right? That at finite temperature, the symmetries are restored. So that's how it works. So there is a non-perturbative, uh, there is a potentially non-perturbative scale at finite temperature, but the radiative corrections save you. So that's the bottom line. And the same will be true in all the examples that I'm going to tell you about. So I'm not going to repeat this story again and again and again. Uh, it's the same thing. In all the examples that I'm going to talk about, uh, the, the non-perturbative scale is avoided by, uh, by, uh, by these radiative corrections. OK, so, so yes. Uh, uh, can I ask what the quantity are you subtracting? Yeah, you use a zeta function regularization. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just close the door because the echo is driving me crazy. Yeah. So you're asking how do we know that this is the correct answer? That the sum over the integers is uh, minus one over twelve, right? Yeah. If it's patching function, I know this is a quantum term for the zero uh, for the ground state energy, but here okay. I didn't see. Okay, so the way you justify it is the following. So there is a counter term that you could have added in four dimensions. Uh, namely, uh, instead of starting this theory at the fixed point, you could add a mass squared, m squared, phi squared. So there is a divergence that corresponds to that counter term. But 
uh, this dependence of the mass squared on temperature goes like temperature squared, okay? And the counter term cannot depend on temperature in such a fashion. So the way to justify it is to take two derivatives with respect to beta. So you take this formula, you take two derivatives with respect to beta, and then you get completely convergent integrals and a completely convergent sum. And, uh, and then you can derive this uh, without any doubt. Namely, you are computing completely correct convergent sums and completely convergent integrals. So the short answer is basically you can take derivatives with respect to temperature. So you're not interested in the piece of the mass squared that is temperature independent. That's a counter term. And we've uh, tuned uh, this counter term so that we're the second order phase transition. So physically what we're doing is we want to be here at the red point. We want to be at the phase transition. So this is basically zeta minus one. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm just justifying why this is the correct way of resumming this uh, sum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what I'm saying is that you could have taken derivatives and rendered the sum completely convergent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's, let me just define the setup in which I'll be interested. This is a very limited class of theories but they're rich enough for the purposes of investigating this question. So we just have n scalar fields, phi i, and some potential. So these couplings are just an arbitrary symmetric, uh, arbitrary symmetric tensor with four indices, which I call lambda twiddle. And this are, is going to be studied in four minus epsilon space-time dimensions. And I will take epsilon to be the smallest parameter. Okay, this is the setup. This is a big class of theories. And if you believe that there is a theorem, this is the first class of theories you should study. Okay, so you might believe that there is a theorem that this can never happen because you would always encounter something like a Casimir energy and Casimir energies are always negative. And maybe there is a theorem that you'll never get symmetry breaking, okay? So if epsilon is the smallest parameter, we know that we can look for fixed points a la Wilson and Fisher. And the fixed point equation is this. So you get some complicated equation for uh, real couplings with uh, four indices. And you have to solve this equation to find fixed points in the epsilon expansion. It's convenient to get rid of the 16 pi squared and epsilon. So I'll define lambda in this, in this way to get rid of these uh, three factors. And then you just get a beautiful equation like that, sorry. You get a beautiful equation for some uh, tensors with four indices, which are completely symmetric. And you have to look for solutions. Uh, those will correspond, correspond to fixed points, to conformal filters. And then you try to put them at finite temperature and you ask if they break some symmetries. Okay, that's the course of action of this, uh, of this work. Nobody has been able to solve these equations in complete generality. So we don't know the full classification of uh, wilson fisher fixed points. But it's useful to use symmetry principles to, to attack this problem step by step. Oh, before I go to classifying, let me just make a comment that if we put the systems at finite temperature, one generates some thermal masses, very much like the thermal masses that we've seen in the previous example, very much like this thing, like these diagrams. You have to recompute them within this epsilon expansion and you get something like that. So you get the trace a trace over two indices out of four. So if I give you a fixed point, it's a straightforward exercise uh, to compute the thermal mass squared. And you can then ask if it's positive or negative. Now, using the fixed point equation, you can write this formula for the thermal mass squared. And amusingly, the second piece is positive definite. So this is a positive definite contraction of this indice of these tensors with four indices. While this piece is not necessarily positive definite. So uh, it can go either way. There is one piece that's always positive, one piece that's not, and it can go either way. Okay, so let's just review the simplest possible thing. The simplest possible thing, which is also the most well-studied thing, is the ON fixed point. The one with complete symmetry among the N scalar fields that we've introduced. This corresponds to this tensor with four indices with some alpha that you have to find by solving the one loop equations, by solving these equations. You find it uh, and then you compute the thermal mass squared and that's what you find. 
So there is a positive thermal mass cord and there is no symmetry breaking at finite temperature. There is ordinary device screening and the thermal gap. So this behaves exactly like you would expect. There is nothing um, exotic going on. Now let's try to be more general. You might not want to give up at this point because we've just studied the ON fixed points, but there are many other fixed points in the epsilon expansion. So the way to think about it is to ask what symmetry group G does your fixed point preserve out of the ON symmetry. So G is some subgroup of ON because uh, it, it's a subgroup of the symmetry that rotates all the scalar fields. So there is a no-go theorem that you can prove. Let me just quote it. I'm not going to prove this no-go theorem. But the no-go theorem says that if G is such that it only has one quadratic invariant, then symmetry breaking does not take place. OK, so there are several ways of stating this theorem. Another way of stating it is that if the fundamental representation of ON is irreducible as a representation of G, then symmetry breaking does not take place. It's equivalent to the condition that there is only one quadratic invariant of G. And then you can prove that this doesn't happen. Okay, so that's a technical proof, but it's correct. And it covers a huge amount of examples, actually, surprisingly. Many of the magnets, ferromagnets that we study in, uh, in condensed matter and in high energy physics, uh, like the, these are the ON models, the cubic tetrahedral, bifundamental, MN, tetragonal, Michel fixed points, all of this obey the no-go theorem, actually. So all of these uh, fixed points that you can see in the, in the Wilson-Fisher expansion, they all obey this theorem. So that may be a quantum field theory posteriori explanation for why this is so widespread, that you know, symmetries are stored at high temperature. But this does not completely uh, close the curtain on the problem because the no-go theorem only applies if G obeys this uh, condition. What about examples where G doesn't obey this condition? Are there any questions about the no-go theorem uh, before I go, uh, before I proceed further? One qu question. The tartrate example, can you formulate it in this language? and? Describe it in terms of symmetries? Yeah. This? Yeah. All of these fixed points, the cubic, tetrahedral, bifundamental, the men, they're all given by um, some symmetry groups, which are subgroups of ON. They are sometimes big discrete subgroups. Sometimes they are continuous times discrete. And they're all listed in this review. And for each one of them, you can see uh, which symmetry group it preserves, and then you can just check that uh, uh, it has only one quadratic invariant. So if part rate example, does that have only one or does that have two? This one? The tart rate, the, the one that, the funny one with the intermediate symmetry. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're asking about this one. Um, you're asking about the salt. This one. Yes? Is this what you're asking about? Yes, that's right. OK, so this example uh, has actually two quadratic casimirs. So it's a nice observation. Yes, it's actually has, it actually has two. So it does not fall into the no-go theorem. Any other questions? OK, so let me just study. So what we did is to study the simplest possible theory which uh, does not obviously uh, satisfy the no-go theorem. I mean, it doesn't satisfy the no-go theorem because it has two quadratic casimirs. And we've uh, found that it has many interesting properties that uh, might remind you of uh, many things that you've seen before. So the simplest, theory, the simplest symmetry group is this. So you, instead of preserving ON, you preserve OM times ON minus M. And then you have two quadratic casimirs corresponding to, uh, so we have two vectors, phi1 and phi2. The first one is of length m, and the second one is of length n minus m. These are the quartic Casimirs. So this is the most general potential you can write. And there are two quadratic Casimirs corresponding to phi1 squared and phi2 squared. So you just plug, plug it into the machine, and then you work it out. You the machine is this bunch of fixed point equations. These are the fixed point equations for the couplings alpha, beta, and gamma. You have to solve these equations 
find the allowed fixed points, and then uh, find their thermal properties. Okay. Now, these equations are unfortunate, even though they're algebraic and straightforward, it's not something you can solve analytically. Um, it's just not, not uh, it doesn't reduce to quadratic or linear equations. So it's uh, actually useful to think about the problem in a complementary way. But before that, let me just start with the easiest case, which is the equal rank case. The equal rank case is when this is the same as that. In the equal rank case, these equations do simplify, and you can solve them analytically, and that's what you find. So you actually find two fixed points. Of course, you find the fixed point where all alpha, beta, and gamma are the same, and that fixed point, since alpha, beta, and gamma are all the same, that fixed point actually has an enhanced O-N symmetry, and we are not interested in that fixed point since it obeys the no-go theorem. But you find the new fixed point, and in this new fixed point, um, in this new fixed point, uh, gamma can be negative. But that doesn't mean that the theory is unstable. Because even if gamma is negative, it doesn't mean that there is an instability. Because alpha and beta can be large enough. And they are large enough. You can check that this fixed point is stable. Unfortunately, even in that fixed point, when you go on and compute the thermal masses, you find that they are positive. So there is, again, no symmetry breaking. And you might become despondent at that point, that maybe no examples exist. So the thermal masses are all positive, regardless of whether m is bigger than 4 or smaller than 4. So now let me tell you about the surprising thing. The surprising thing is that if you go to the non-equal rank case, you do find symmetry breaking. So let me just go take you through the derivation. And the derivation, I'm presenting a derivation which is not, I mean, you could just put these equations on the computer and show that this is true. But I'm taking you through a derivation that involves taking a large n limit because that derivation extends to a finite epsilon, not just infinitesimal epsilon. So that's why it's very interesting to do it in this way. So let's take a large n limit. So we rescale the couplings, and we will assume that m over n is kept fixed. So the ratio of, a, the ratio of m and n minus m is kept fixed in this limit. So we take some large n limit with a fixed ratio, and we found the following things. So I'm listing the results these are the results about the leading order planar theory in the limit of a large n. First of all, instead of one or two fixed points, which is what we've seen at finite n, there is a circle of fixed points. So there is an exactly marginal operator, very much like in supersymmetric theories. There is a whole circle of fixed points. And some points on the circle can be easily identified. So we find one fixed point, which is the critical on fixed point with enhanced to n symmetry. Then there are some, these blue fixed points correspond to some decoupled fixed points, which definitely exist. And then there is a whole circle of fixed points, but of course, they're mostly unphysical. Only some of those fixed points would survive to finite rank. It cannot be that all of these fixed points exist at finite rank. They are like artifacts of the large n limit. But it's interesting to ask which of these fixed points survives to finite rank. In any case, at large n, there is an exactly marginal parameter which is very strange given that there is no supersymmetry. Another fact which is also very surprising is that there is a modular space of vacua at large n. This is a zero temperature. So at zero temperature, there is a modular space of vacua. The modular space of vacua is just a line that comes out of the CFT. So we have phi one squared and phi two squared. And in the leading order in the large n limit, there is a modular space of vacua which corresponds to a line in this uh, diagram. And along this line, there is a diloton and number Goldstone bosons. This kind of modular spaces of aqua are, again, very commonplace in supersymmetry. But here they exist in the large n limit without supersymmetry. Uh, Zohar, sorry yeah. to interrupt. I yeah. think this is happening uh, because these are uh, double traces. Yeah, you can think. You can think about this interaction. In fact, in other contexts, at large n with double trace, it's trace, it's the same thing. Yeah, the it is true. Uh, you can think about it as a double trace deformation, and there are other examples where such things happen. Yeah, I agree. Uh, now, the most surprising thing to me 
was that now you can ask what happens to this modular space of aqua and uh, fixed points at finite temperature. And amazingly, what one finds is that it's not lifted. So the modular space of aqua, instead of being a straight line coming out of the conformal fixed point, it becomes a parabola. Sorry, a, I should say a hyperbola. And the hyperbola can bend either this way or this way. And so this is striking for the following reason. If, so if you can prove, if, if you believe the fact that there is a hyperbola at finite temperature, a hyperbola of vacua, you don't need to do anything else. You immediately establish symmetry breaking at finite temperature. Why? Because the hyperbola does not intersect the origin. However, it's very important to understand if the hyperbola is this one or this one. This is important because it doesn't correspond to the same symmetry breaking pattern. Here, there is a point where phi two is non-zero, but phi one vanishes, and here it's the opposite. And this doesn't correspond to the exact same symmetry breaking pattern. So, if you so this kind of deformed moduli spaces are of course very familiar to people who studied supersymmetry. Uh, there is a fam there are famous examples in supersymmetry where there is a moduli space of aqua that is deformed. Here we see the same thing at finite temperature. So instead of the, the moduli space of vacua being phi one squared minus phi two squared vanishing, it's deformed by temperature. So what we did, instead of solving these equations on the computer, you know, numerically, we took the large n limit and we've shown that the moduli space of vacua is deformed to a hyperbola. And this is enough. Once you do that, you're finished. Because if you know that this is deformed to a hyperbola, and if you know that this coefficient is non-zero, you're done because then it's guaranteed that whatever happens at finite temperature, whatever happens at finite rank, there will be symmetry breaking at finite temperature. And of course, we check numerically that this is uh, correct. We check by solving these equations numerically that all these conclusions are true. Uh, now let me tell you more concretely what's going on. So the most interesting thing is the sign of this C. So whether the hyperbola is like this or the hyperbola is like that. Sorry, sorry, may I ask was a uh, coordinate, it's a phi one, phi two, or phi one square, phi two square? In terms of phi one square, phi two square, this is a linear equation, right? The equation you write is linear in phi one square and phi oh, two yeah. square. Um, um, uh, yeah, I was, um, I was kind of, uh, the, the diagram is incorrect, you're completely correct. Yeah, the diagram is incorrect. The diagram should have been Phi one, phi two, not phi one squared, phi two squared. So the diagram should have been phi one, phi two. I'm sorry for that. In fact, uh, is that okay? It's just a stupid typo on the diagram. It should okay, have been. Yeah, okay. It should have been phi one, phi or two. Or you could just write it as a. You could just write it as a straight line. Shift it. Just shift from the origin. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I just. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's just a typo on the diagram. I'm sorry for that. So the most important thing is to compute this uh, deformation of the moduli space, the sine of C. And uh, we've done that. I would not take you through the computation. It's uh, not illuminating, but that's the key thing that you gotta do. I'll just tell you the answer. Oh, one more thing is that it may happen that C vanishes. If C vanishes, it means that the moduli space is completely undeformed, even at finite temperature. And then you don't know that symmetry breaking takes place at finite rank because there is a point where the moduli space intersects the origin. So then finite rank corrections can just put you at the origin. And in fact, that's exactly what happens at equal rank. So remember that before I told you that at equal rank, the whole thing doesn't work. So the reason that equal rank is consistent with this picture with the hyperbolas is because the hyperbolas are not deformed at the equal rank. So this coefficient C happens to vanish at equal rank. And this, of course, follows from symmetry because at equal rank, phi one and phi two are on the same footing. So you can interchange them. And therefore, C equals zero is the only obvious thing that can happen. So let me just jump to the main point. This is just, okay. So the main point uh, is that we can compute the sine of C. And furthermore, there is some work that you have to do to understand uh, on this hyperbola, where is the true vacuum at finite rank? And it turns out that it's always at the vertex of the hyperbola. By the vertex, I mean it's where the hyperbola intersects one of the axes. So the bottom line of this whole thing is that only one of the scalar fields condenses, and which one it is, 
phi one or phi two depends on the on the ratio of the two ranks. So whether O m is bigger than O n minus m or the opposite. And if they're exactly equal, m and n minus m are exactly equal, then none condenses. And you're, you basically have a trivial disordered phase at finite temperature. Uh, so, sorry, Zohar, just yes. to make sure. So this constant and the deformation, so constancy and the deformation comes from the induced thermal mass, right? Yes. Okay. But the induced thermal mass tells you that the origin is not a good, uh, not a good vacuum. So you slide away from the origin. But uh, there is not a unique vacuum. At large end, the space of vacua is a hyperbola. And indeed, at the origin, the Hessian is negative. So there is some negative eigenvalue. But you, you slide away, and then you have this deformed modular space. It's very similar to the correction, quantum corrections to the modular space in supersymmetric theories that you know very well, that the origin becomes a bad point. And instead, you have a deformed modular space of vacua. Thanks. Of course, there it happens due to quantum corrections. And here it happens due to thermal fluctuations. And here it's only at large n. Of course, at finite n, these are non-supersymmetric fixed points. There is one fixed point, one vacuum, and uh, it's at the vertex of the hyperbola. And we checked it numerically. So here is the bottom line. The ratio of the two ranks, m to n, is some number in between 0 and 1. And we need to find where is the vacuum of the hyperbola. And the answer is very simple, surprisingly. If x is bigger than a half, namely m is bigger than n minus m, it's the phi 1 squared that condenses. Sorry, it's phi 2 squared that condenses. If m is smaller than n minus m, it's the opposite. So it's phi 1 squared that condenses. And phi 2 does not condense. And if x is exactly a half, then none of them condenses. And the vacuum is disordered at finite temperature. So what does it mean? It means that OM times ON minus M symmetry is broken such that the smaller group is, of the two is broken. And if they're equal, then none is broken. Let me just see if I have, yeah. So this is the answer. I'm going to go back to the other slide, but this is the symmetry breaking pattern. OM times ON minus M at finite temperature is broken to OM minus one times ON minus M if M is smaller, if M is the smaller between the two. If this is the smaller between the two, it will be minus one here. The minus one will be here. And if they're equal, the none is broken. That's the bottom line, it's very simple. So as long as the ranks are not equal, you have a number Goldstone bosons at finite temperature. So the finite temperature phase is not disordered, it's broken. Uh, and there are exact number Goldstone bosons, which parameterize a sphere. And if the ranks are exactly equal, there is a thermal gap. That's the phase diagram of the model at large n. At x equals a half, there is a thermal gap. And otherwise, there is a sphere of the number Goldstone bosons. Okay, so this is uh, the simplest example where at finite temperature, instead of getting a thermal gap, you get a superfluid phase. Be what I said before is that this doesn't extend to two plus one dimensions. Why doesn't it extend to two plus one dimensions? Because it involves a continuous symmetry breaking. And in two plus one dimensions, there is a Coleman theorem. So all of this is actually true only for epsilon, which is smaller than one. Okay, so these examples are good within um, the epsilon expansion, and they're even good for finite epsilon. But they're not going to extend all the way to two plus one. Because in 2 plus 1, there is a non-perturbative effect, which is very, very tiny. It's e to the minus n. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Did my screen sharing disappear? No. Did no. Not? I think so. uh, something. It hand? It says sharing is paused. No. Uh, okay, let me fix it. I don't know what I don't know what happened. Can you move your car cursor so that? Uh, something happened, and my screen sharing uh, is saying that it's a. Uh, 
stopped. No, it, it's working, working. We can see your scars are moving. Good. Yeah. yeah, it's back also for me. So even so, while these examples are not true counterexamples to the you know common belief that symmetries are restored at finite temperature, they're actually very interesting also in two plus one dimensions, because in two plus one dimensions there is this tiny non-perturbative effect which moves removes the Goldstone bosons, so there is no strict symmetry breaking. But since this effect is so tiny, it means that um, there is a huge gap between the thermal scale and the actual scale of the massive particles, and and this is very strange because usually you think that at finite temperature t the gap is of order t but here we see that there is e to the minus n uh, because there are these number goldstone bosons which are lifted only by infrared non-perturbative effect so there is a huge gap and so there are particles much 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 lighter than the thermal scale exponentially lighter so while this in two plus one dimensions it doesn't work per se it leads to an interesting violation of the common belief that the correlation length should be of order t. Okay. Let me just uh, uh, make one remark, uh, one important remark. Among these examples, there is only one example which may work, strictly speaking, also in 2 plus 1. And that's where m is equal to 1. Because O1 is the same as Z2, and this is then empty. So if uh, so we have to analyze uh, specifically the case of O1 times ON minus one, because that case is the only one that may survive to truly two plus one dimensions. So here I have some slides about this uh, specific uh, example, uh, about the you know, construction of the O1 times ON minus one model and an attempt to show that it actually works in two plus one. But I, I don't want to take you through that because I actually know about it much more than in the slides. And I'll just tell you the bottom line. The bottom line is that the example with O1 times ON minus one symmetry uh, cannot be at the moment uh, proven to exist and work in two plus one dimensions uh, because one needs a certain OP coefficient that is not known in the literature in the large N expansion of the ON model. Uh, there is a group uh, by Goichmann and Smolkin who are computing it and it will be available very soon. But at the moment, the existence of this, the, whether or not this example works in two plus one dimensions is uh, not uh, decidable because it depends on some data that we don't have. So the bottom line is that we've constructed uh, examples that work at in fractional dimensions, violating this uh, common belief, but we don't have an example yet in uh, strictly speaking integer dimensions. It's not one that we can prove works. So what do we learn? We learned that it's, it seems possible that the critical point would be in a broken phase. That's unlike chiral symmetry or ferromagnets, but it seems possible as far as uh, the rules of quantum filtering go. And we've constructed examples in four minus epsilon dimensions where epsilon was allowed to vary between zero and one, but we did not have examples with epsilon equals one. Um, Gauge theories are very interesting. Can it happen in gauge theories in three plus one dimensions? For instance, gauge theories with scalars. Can it be that the scalars would condense? I can talk a little bit about it. If there are people in the audience who wanna ask about it, I can tell you what happens in the simplest gauge theories with scalars. Um, I mean, also these models can probably make better contact with black hole physics. Since here I was discussing vector models and vector models don't have a standard idea as dual. And then, of course, uh, one has to understand uh, the fate of this Z2 times ON model. Uh, and one can also ask about models with less relevant operators. This model that I discussed, the OM times ON minus M model, has three relevant operators. What about models with less? And so on. So these are all open questions, but uh, I mean, at least within this large N or epsilon expansion, uh, we were able to construct counterexamples. And now it remains to see what happens next. Sorry, in gravity, there are soft hairs, right? Say again? In gravity, around yeah. back, there are soft hair modes, right? What soft hair modes? Like, for example, in three-dimensional gravity, there are boundary graviton modes. No, no, that has nothing to do with the order parameters for local symmetries. 
I'm here talking about the hair that uh, the no hair theorem that I'm having in mind is that if you have a global symmetry on the boundary, that translates to a gauge gauge symmetry in the bulk. And uh, the hair that yeah. I have in mind is that the day, that gauge shield will be Higgs. You, the hair that you're talking about is this BMS thing, and you know it has nothing to do with global symmetries. It's a different method of symmetry. Yeah, yeah, but it has nothing to do with the uh, with uh, the. What you're talking about is just the fact that uh, uh, there is a Virasor algebra in uh, on the boundary or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that that that, that has nothing to do with the global symmetries. Also, the examples you're talking about they are in one plus one, and as I said. In one plus one dimensional filters, you can just rule out the existence of symmetry breaking at finite temperature, just from modular invariance. I'm just saying those those models doesn't uh, uh, because of those VSO uh, generators, it doesn't uh, uh, have a gap at at the order of temperature. Um. Um, let me think about it for a second. I, I'm not sure about that. I don't think so. I, I, I don't think you're right. I think once you put finite temperature, it goes away. But in any case, it's uh, unrelated. To, because in one plus one you cannot have a global symmetry breaking in one plus one at finite temperature. Can you say some more about the gauge theory case? Okay, so the gauge theory. So the simplest Benzac's uh, fixed points, which have uh, which are weakly coupled and they have scalar fields, um, have um, so surprisingly. Even the simple, okay, what are the simplest uh, Bengzax fixed points? You have NF fermions and NS scalars, and you tune NF and NS in such a way that the one loop beta function is approximately zero. That's how we construct Bengzax fixed points, right? Now, it turns out that this is only possible if, an, if the number of scalars is not too large. So if you have a gauge theory coupled to only scalars, uh, then uh, there is no Bengzax fixed point, surprisingly. There is a Bengzax fixed point only if there is both fermions and scalars and the number of scalars is not too large. And then you compute the thermal masses and they turn out to be negative. But because the number of scalars is not too large, you enter what's called the color flavor locking phase instead of a symmetry breaking phase. So actually no global symmetry turns out to be broken in the end of the day when the dust settles. And amazingly, we've looked at many, many Bengzax fixed points of this sort. And in all of them, the number of scalars is limited in such a way that in the end of the day, you enter a color flavor locked phase instead of a <clears throat> symmetry breaking phase. So there is some kind of conspiracy that uh, has so far uh, pre prevented us from constructing a counterexample in uh, gauge theories. Any other question? Okay, seems that there are no other questions. So should I uh, stop the sharing now? Or yours? Um, may I ask a question? Oh, okay, yes. Um, so actually, I'm a condensed matter physicist, so uh, I want to ask about some um, realization in lattice model or some condensed matter systems. Do you have any idea about that? Yeah, so in uh, lattice models with finitely many degrees of freedom per lattice site, it's easy to prove that at high temperatures, you always have a disordered phase. Uh huh. Um, if you look at our paper, we have a reference. We have a proof. We actually like wrote the proof and also some references. Oh, okay. But this doesn't mean that the question is void of content because um, imagine a lattice system where the correlation length is C and the lattice scale is A. Uh -huh. So you can still ask, what is the required temperature to enter a disordered phase? 
So what oh. I see is that the temperature is of order of the lattice scale, you would always enter the disordered phase. But oh. what, can it be that the temperature would be much, much bigger than C to the minus one? So you're asking basically, do you need to heat up the lattice system to the scale of the correlation length? Or do you need to heat up the lattice system to the lattice scale? So quantum filter is an interesting approximation, or quantum filter is a framework that describes lattice systems at the scales which are much bigger than the lattice scale, right? Right. So the question that I'm asking here can be translated to the lattice um, quite uh, naturally. Uh, the question of whether the temperature that is required to enter a disordered phase is of the lattice scale, or mm -hmm. can it be much, much, much lower than the lattice scale? Uh -huh. But much bigger than the correlation length. I see. So there is a lattice. Yeah, so you can phrase it in the lattice. You can put these models that I discussed on the lattice, this OM times ON minus M magnet. And yeah, I think it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Zohar, can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. When you do the epsilon expansion, at least for fractional values of epsilon, strictly speaking, the theory is non unitary. Now, do you have any good reason to expect that you might get something unitary in some integer dimension? You're asking, well, I, let me just try to say, you're asking if I have any reason to believe that there are examples in integer dimensions? Right, which are unitary, because typically when you work something out in the epsilon expansion, you break unitarity and then you hope maybe to recover it at some limit. Is there any signal that you will get something like this? No. The, I did not believe that there are examples in the epsilon expansion because the non-unitarity in the epsilon expansion is very, very mild. Um, but as I said, the main question that is posed here is not answered. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm not able, I, we were not able to prove a theorem yet. And we were not able to, pro to provide a counter example yet. And I don't know the answer to the question. So you can say that the epsilon expansion constructions, we have two constructions that work. One is large n, and that actually works even in integer dimensions, infinite n. And the other is epsilon expansion. But both of them are kind of unsatisfactory because as you said, finite rank in the epsilon expansion is not fully unitary. And large rank or infinite rank in any number of dimensions is not a complete quantum field theory either. So we don't have an example with finitely many degrees of freedom that's fully unitary where this phenomenon takes place. I see. Uh, I have also a comment to your original uh, statement about now going to holography about uh, black holes for, for non-trivial black holes for CFTs. In fact, uh, two years ago, we did find such black holes, um, uh, not in a generic case, of course, but in very special uh, contexts. And we were able also to show something in general, that the CFT for which such black holes and therefore saddle points, different saddle points, where uh, uh, there was a VEV, in that case, the VEV was not necessarily associated with the breaking of a symmetry, but it was a scalar hair, if you wish. Um, you could always show that the free energy of that black hole for any given temperature was lower than the saddle, the trivial saddle point for the CFT, that is the, the standard one. Right, but if it, does, if it doesn't break a global symmetry, how is that different from uh, the kind of black holes you expect in N equals 4? Uh, it is different because a, a scalar is running. There is a VEV for a scalar. But there are many scalars also in n equals four that have a VEV at finite temperature. Okay. I mean, they don't break any symmetry, just scalar operators which have a VEV. Right, so I'm not answering the issue of asymmetry, although in that case, you can make context where you break as a two symmetry. Well, but if you example with you that- of hairy black holes, which are asymptotically ADS, you can have them. Uh, but you mean large black holes or small black holes? I'm talking about large black holes. Right. So even in the ON model, just the ON model, you know, the simplest thing, there is an operator, which is a scalar field, which gets a VEV. It doesn't break any symmetry, but it gets a finite temperature VEV. Just phi squared. Phi squared gets a VEV. 
but it doesn't break any symmetry. So um, you're talking about some kind of different hair. But I'm talking about two distinct saddle points. You have one saddle point, which is the standard thermal, thermal saddle point of a CFT, and there the waves are zero. The waves of the various scalars are zero. And then you can have another one, which is in fact always a moduli space, and uh, in that case, and uh, in that, uh, and the moduli space is basically the web. The web can be anything. And this is a distinct, it's a single bulk solution. It's a single black hole solution, but it describes a continuum of saddle points for the QFT labeled by the web. But that sounds a lot like uh, some of these things that I talked about, except that uh, in what I talked about, there is actually symmetry breaking. It's not just scalar web. Right. In the context, I can probably provide uh, in private details uh, later on. It's in print, in fact, um, but uh, I can provide details. But we found them not because we were looking for it, but it came out looking for something else. It sounds a lot like this hyperbolas that you have a continuum of black holes with a modular space of aqua. Uh, there is a difference to that. Generically, this moduli space e exists for finite temperature, but not for zero temperature, not at the same time. Oh, okay. Yeah, here the, so, model, the model that we had at large n had the moduli space at zero temperature, which was deformed. Deformed. That's not the generic case, at least in, in, in the holographic setup that we, we, we understand. I see, but you don't have an example where there is a symmetry here, or do you? I can make a Z2, but not more complicated, but I will have to, to think about it. Even Z2 is very interesting because I don't think that there is an example in the literature where there is a... So Bushel has some papers about the hairy black holes, but they did not dominate the ensemble. So they had a higher free energy. Ah, but here also it's the same. These never dominate the trivial uh, uh, thermal saddle point. That you can oh, prove. I, th I, thought, I thought you said that they have a lower free energy. No, no, no. They have a higher free energy, always. Ah, I thought you said lower. Okay, okay. No, no, no. 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 Okay. Yeah, so I've seen papers like that by Bushel from uh, 10, 7, and even two years ago with the hairy black holes that do not dominate the ensemble. That's right. Okay. That there might be in the same sort of, uh, in the same ballpark. Yeah. So the thing is that in, if you try to interpret what I'm saying in this language, then this would be hairy black holes that do dominate the ensemble. This is the correct low energy state. Right. Yeah, you should probably, right. if you can send me the reference, that would be great because we're working on a revised version now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, guys, uh, uh, <clears throat> we have to clap for Zohar for giving such a nice talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, like, if you guys have more questions, please ask. I don't see any more. Okay. Somebody is asking probably. Oh, did somebody? Who, who, who wants to ask? Anybody can ask. I just don't see. Uh, maybe can, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, can you brief comment on in, in this model how the spectrum looks like uh, when epsilon goes to one? In, when epsilon goes to one? Yeah. Ah, when epsilon goes, so um, in the, let's say in the large rank limit, mm -hmm. uh, in the large rank limit, uh, you mean at finite temperature? The spectrum at finite temperature, yeah. yeah. So at finite temperature, um, there is this moduli space of aqua. So there is one massless mode that takes you along the moduli space. But then at every point on this moduli space of aqua, there is also a bunch of number Goldstone bosons. Now, when you take epsilon to one, the number Goldstone bosons disappear. They are lifted by a small, exponentially small effect, e to the minus n, because of Coleman's theorem. But so basically, you have many, many particles which are extremely light, much lower than the temperature scale. Uh, we have some details about the spectrum and the four point function. Uh, in an appendix in the paper. So we actually did uh, compute the spectrum fully. But, for fi but not for epsilon equals one, just uh, some you know, random finite epsilon between zero and one. Uh, 
Yeah, the, the answer is basically there is some kind of dilaton-like particle and number Goldstone bosons. That's the, the zero order answer. Uh, okay, so in terms of the uh, free energy uh, and the specific heat around that uh, point, uh, what's, the, what's the order of specific heat? It's like uh, exponentially small. Um, you are asking about the specific heat. Let me think if I know the answer. Um, I think that the existence of massless particles uh, does not render the specific heat vanishing. Um, it's a sublinear correction. So the contribution to the specific heat of light particles is uh, not suppressed or something of that sort. So I would expect that the specific heat is positive and, and uh, I mean, it scales like the temperature as it should with dimensional analysis. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but my guess is that there is nothing uh, fishy about the specific heat. The reason I'm guessing that is that um, I think that the existence of massless particles would uh, only ruin the volume scaling of the partition function by subleading effects, something like uh -huh. logarithm of the volume, not an extensive. It's not going to be an extensive effect, I think. So anyway, my guess is that uh -huh. there's. It's just a guess. My guess is, guess is that there is nothing fishy about the specific kit, but I we didn't compute it, frankly speaking. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, th I guess uh, the the classical setup was still varying. And uh, this will just give you the, uh, as you said, the logarithm uh, correction to the patching function. Typically, if you have a theory with a moduli space of aqua, the thermodynamic relations are still obeyed. The violations are only by sub-extensive quantities. That's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Like if you have a massless free field, then it would still obey thermodynamics. It's just that there will be some logarithm of the volume on top of that, which is kind of subleading. Anyway, that's my guess, but uh, I, I might be wrong. But definitely we found the right vacua. These are the lowest lying, uh, these are the minimum free energy uh, states. The, the, that's for sure. Like that's the, you know, if we did a mistake there, then the whole paper is wrong. But these are definitely the lowest free energy states. Okay, thank you. So guys, you have any other question to ask to Zohar? Please ask. I think everybody already went home. <laughs> oh, I mean. I think nobody has. Okay. Thank you so much for hosting me. Yeah. Nice, cool. nice evening. Yeah. And uh, like, be safe. Take care and uh, uh, many, many thanks to you for giving your time. And I know that you are handling a lot of things right now, but you have managed to give time. That's, it's really precious for us that you have discussed your recent paper with us. And uh, yeah, we will uh, uh, maybe talk to each other again sometime. Your microphone is uh, off. I'm saying, yeah, surely we'll talk sometime in the future. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Have a good so, evening. Yeah, bye.